Thank you for that prayer. Everybody's here. Okay, uh, we, we began a great study. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. The, uh, the book of Daniel. And uh, we probably know more about the Daniel as a person than we do uh, any other prophet, practically. But it's a great study, and I'm going to introduce it, and then we're going to go into some of those verses that are in the lesson for Sunday. But it's important to have an introduction. And I, for the sake of the teachers uh, this, uh, here, I wanted to talk about maybe just real quick some great uh, materials that you can find on, probably on the Internet. One of them is H.A. H. Ironside, and uh, I think he's probably quoted in here somewhere, but uh, Thomas uh, Constable, uh, it's under Tom, it's Constable's Notes, it's Thomas Constable. And then J. Vernon McGee, those are three, you know, godly men who are dead and gone now, but all of their lifetime works, they had a calling. Back in that, those days, people got a calling. And they had a, spent their whole lifetime uh, putting out material. And these were solid people who had a ministry of the Word of God over a lifetime. So, you know, tonight in chapter one, it's uh, Ironside, I think this was Ironside's little index, he called chapter one the needed moral condition to know and understand God's mind. Uh, and, and with that, I'll put that down. There's a lot of choices that Daniel will make, right? We know that he decided he didn't want to be defiled when he went into exile. And we'll be looking at a little bit of that tonight. But this is a good way to look at this right here at the beginning. Choices lead to character. And character leads to at least God promoting you. Career. But if you put your career ahead of your character, that's not a good one, is it? He, in other words, we're going to see tonight that God did grant Daniel favor. He gave, him new, he gave him insight into things that no other man had ever known. And he able, enabled him to have, you know, some visions and some interpretation of dreams. We'll see that. And he gave, us, he gave Daniel one of the greatest prophecies ever, ever presented to anyone. In fact, this is one of the quotes that's on your, on your outline I gave you. The book of Daniel is the most comprehensive prophetic revelation of the Old Testament giving the only total view of world history from when? From the time of Babylon to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, all the way through, and that includes every Gentile world empire. And so and, and if you do study widely, you're going to run into higher critics and liberal scholars who say that Daniel could not have written this, and it could not have happened, it had to come and be written after the fact because it's so clear. He even, you know, like Alexander the Great, this was, you know, way in the, in the history. It was all in Dan. And so they come along and they say, well, you know, he couldn't have written it back then. In the sixth century, it had to be written after all these facts, you see. You know what's wrong with that? What's funny about that? We have the Septuagint. The Septuagint was written, get this, it was written before those events, before the Maccabees and uh, Antiochus, Epiphanes, uh, written before that, and it's got Daniel in it, right? The whole thing is in the Septuagint. So that shows the early, early period that Daniel certainly was written. Sixth century B.C., and the reason the liberals don't like it, they have a fit over Daniel. The reason they don't like it, they don't believe in predictive history. Predictive uh, prophecy, excuse me. Predictive prophecy. And Daniel did predict. He gave a revelation of the view of the whole of whole history. The Gentile world powers all the way down to the second coming of Jesus Christ when he knocks out the final great empire of the world, the world government, the world armies and that kind of thing when Jesus comes again. So it's pretty interesting. And don't let the liberals uh, pull you away from the, your belief in the scripture because it's so clear. I, you know, I was thinking about it this morning and I don't want to waste too much time illustrating anything. But if you woke up, you know, if you were, say, at another time, you were relaxed, you were in the, 
uh, say in the mountains somewhere, and you went into a cave, and you went into that cave, and you found a clay jug, had a lid on it, and you broke the thing open, and there was a scroll. And let's say it was the scroll of Daniel, okay? But it would be written in Chaldean, and it would be written in Hebrew. Written in two different languages, Chaldean or Aramaic, or and Hebrew, okay? There it is. And so you don't know what it is, so would you take it to the scholars, and they, they interpret it for you, and hand it back to you in, in English where you can read it. It's the book of Daniel. I'm going to ask you this. Would you read it? Would you read it? Would you dare read it? That's what we have. You know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you remember those? That was in a cave. A cave. You know, those people, probably the Qumran community uh, that put those scrolls there, they believe that somehow they had to preserve God's word forever. So they put them in clay pots, sealed those pots, and then some little shepherd boy threw some, you know, something up in the cave and heard a clank, clank. And he went in there and found all that, you know, multi-millions of dollars of, you know, antiquity, those scriptures. And guess what? Daniel was there. Uh, in fact, uh, a number of other scriptures, even some uh, uh, other scriptures were there. All of them were there. As a matter of fact, Isaiah, the full Isaiah, all the, most of the scriptures it might have missed one or two that I missed in some of the books. But the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I remember studying that when I was in seminary back in the 70s, late 70s. It was pretty exciting. All right, now, so let's uh, think about this. In, in terms of this, and I, I want to spend a lot of time, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but you know, God's not likely, let's just say that God's going to make this revelation. Uh, he's going to give this revelation to Daniel. He's not likely to pick a drunk on the street. I don't want to pick on drunks. But, you know, this guy's walking along out of his mind. You think God's going to give him the revelation that he gave Daniel? Daniel starts off as a young teenager. And we know in just a moment we'll be seeing when his nation was destroyed, he was brought down to Babylon from Jerusalem. And he was put uh, as one of the slaves, uh, brought into the, the king's or, or the Nebuchadnezzar's palace. And he was chosen to, for a three-year education. I don't know why, I don't know whether, Jimmy, that we have seminary for three years, but it was a three-year program that Nebuchadnezzar put them under where they studied the literature and they had to learn the language of the Chaldeans. All right, Chaldeans, that's the, 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 the Babylonians were called Chaldean language. And then they, they had to prepare themselves in every way. They had to uh, meet certain qualifications. We'll see it early, uh, later. But the thing is, character meant something. And God did use people that were prepared in order to give them in, insight and, and more revelation. If we're not prepared, do we really think God's going to give us anything? Because he's called us to study the Word of God. You want, everybody here wants wisdom. You know, and if it was just like, okay, Lord, give me wisdom. And he said, okay, I'm going to try to give you some uh, sense first and put something in your brain. Because not God's not for ignorance. You know, Paul said over and over, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. You know, ignorant brethren are not really people who get insight or wisdom. So I challenge you to, to get in here and, hey, would you study with me? Or will you read the book of Daniel? I'm just asking you to read the book of Daniel. Read it. And you'll be so excited about it, and you're going to get a great deal out of this. And I plan to go all the way through it. I, the lessons pick and choose, but I'm going to go through it pretty well, uh, cover the book of Daniel for you. So let's look at the outline that I gave you. And, and, and uh, a lot of stuff that you go in that first part, that introduction, if you study Ezekiel with us in Sunday school, you know that uh, in 605 B.C., the first group of uh, exiles were brought out of Judah and taken to Babylon. The Nebuchadnezzar had already moved in with his army, 605 B.C., and then 597 B.C., and then 586 B.C. That's when the, fa the fall of Jerusalem was complete. That's when the walls were torn down, the, city, the temple was destroyed and burned, and the city was destroyed, and the only people left was just, you know, the poor people of the down and out, uh, people they took everybody else's slaves to Babylon 
And, uh, you know, and so that's the, that's the first part. The thing that I want to point out, the first exiles was in 605. Remember, you're counting down now with B.C. So, yeah, that, in other words, that's the earliest date, 605. And that's when Daniel was taken. He was taken in 605. And he was uh, a teenager. All the scholars say he was a teenager, maybe 15, 16, 17, maybe 18 years old when he was taken. All right, and they had some great Bible teachers back in Jerusalem like Jeremiah. Jeremiah had been his mentor. Remember, Jeremiah remained in Jerusalem all the way up to the, to the final siege. And so he had, he had known Jeremiah, and this boy was of a raw descent too. And so he would have been, he would have been very much aware of all the teachings of Jeremiah. And then uh, the second group, Ezekiel was taken. Ezekiel was taken right here. And the point I want to make is that Daniel was taken, and he winds up in the, in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. He winds up in the court to serve the, the uh, king, Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of the entire empire, world empire. And so he's going to be serving in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. And Ezekiel right here, when he was taken, he was left with the people. He, he had to bivouac, you know, with the people and by the river Kibar. And he interrelated with people, and Daniel didn't do that. Daniel was going to give, be given three years of education, uh, the Chaldean education, the ways of the Chaldeans that were different from the ways of the Jews, and then he would later serve for 70 years in the, in the court until Nebuchadnezzar was put down and destroyed, and you have Cyrus, the, the Medes, Medes and the Persians come in, and destroy Babylon, see? And then uh, uh, Daniel keeps working for them as well. Seventy years is the span of his ministry. Not everybody has 70 years span. That's that scope there that I give you there. He was probably a teenager, as I said, 15 to 18 years of age. He probably died, all the scholars say, about 85 years of age to 90. That would have put him in there 70 years plus whatever his age was when he went in. And isn't that awesome because he was, uh, he was a scholar. He was a godly man. And he never compromised. And the, the rulers, the Gentile rulers, even though they were pagan, they recognized, this is the man I want working for me. You know? And then it's written, the next section there is on written. Daniel wrote this book under the Holy Spirit's guidance, just like all scriptures inspired by God. We believe that. We have a very high view of Scripture. We do not, uh, you know, deny or doubt the Scripture. You know, the Word of God is, a, you know, live and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's the Word of God. And so the book claims, now here's the point. The book claims in the, in the book itself several times that Daniel was the writer. And I give you the Scriptures for that, chapter 8, chapter 9. And then chapter 20 and chapter 10, verse 2, uh, where Daniel is mentioned as the writer. Ezekiel mentioned Daniel in Ezekiel 14, 14, and Ezekiel 28, 3. Ezekiel mentions Daniel, okay? So they're compadre. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're uh, contemporary. So, you know, they're there at the same time, although they might not have met. One's in the court and one's out there with the people. Whether they met or not, I don't know. But now, Ezekiel was aware uh, of Daniel because he mentions Daniel. And then also, here's the big one. <laughs> this is the big one. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke about the book of Daniel and Daniel being the writer in Matthew 24, verse 15, and Mark 13, and verse 14. Here's what he said, something like this, I paraphrase. He said he was talking about the end of time in the time of the tribulation on the earth. And he says, when you see uh, that death, that, that which brings desolation standing in the temple, that which Daniel spoke of, standing in the temple. So he called him the prophet. Jesus called him the prophet Daniel. Not the dreamer, not the novelist, not the writer, the prophet Daniel, see? Some people have a problem because Jesus called him the prophet Daniel. And he says, when you see this coming, it's going to come. So what was Daniel doing? Predicting what was going to happen in the tribulation. 
Jesus makes that very clear. And then also, the Jews believe that Daniel wrote the book. You know, early on, all those uh, millenniums of Jewish scholars and rabbis and teachers, they believe, you know, that Daniel wrote the book. And then one other thing, I've mentioned church leaders early on, like Jerome, defended the authorship of Daniel. So those, that's pretty good right there, isn't it? So probably Daniel wrote this book late in his life, when he was old, uh, which he could have been about 530 B.C. or a few years later. That's the opinion of the scholars, some scholar. Yeah, he could have made notes all of his life. I've made notes all of my life. I don't even know where they are, so many of them. You know, and then, you know, then you can write a book. And so I think he probably made notes all along because he dated everything he did. Everything is so chronological. It's dated per so perfectly. And so you can, you can figure those dates up. In fact, Sir Robert Anderson, if you've never heard of him, you can Google that and find out. Sir, Sir Robert Anderson, who wrote many, many books uh, in the biblical uh, areas, uh, he actually calculated what da Daniel said in, chap in da Daniel chapter 9, where he talks about all those numbers from the time that they're released from bondage to the time that Jesus would come, the second coming of Christ, he calculated the time right down to April something, uh, A.D., whatever it was, 30, when Jesus walked into Jerusalem coming through the Eastern Gate. They calculated. And so it, it can be calculated. In fact, you can calculate it before you're through with it when you look at it and see what it is. It's very clear. It's no, no doubt about it. Uh, all right, the date of it, uh, as I've already said, evidence is within the book itself points to the origin. Uh, the date is about 6th century B.C. Remember, this would be 6th century B.C., right? I didn't hear. Uh, it fell, this is when it, Jerusalem fell. So 6th century B.C., the date of the book, uh, somewhere in there. Liberals argue against that because they want a later date, because they don't, they don't believe in predictive prophecy. And liberals don't believe in miracles. Liberals don't believe in anything supernatural. And I'm talking about liberals that hold a chair in theology and universities, okay? And so every university that I know of has a, has a department of theology. You know, whether it's in England and Oxford where I attended at one time. And, uh, but you got a lot of great people in some of those departments who really believe the word and they're scholars. They're really good. But then you got some, you always have to fight the battle with German higher criticism. And uh, where they took out, they made an effort to remove anything spiritual, anything that have to do with miracles. Certainly you can't have predictive prophecy because that's kind of a miracle, isn't it? If you look through and, and he wrote down what was going to happen in all of human history. Here it is, the whole view of human history. And that's exactly what you see in Daniel. Now, what you won't see in Daniel, the Lord didn't show him. There's some things that he didn't show him. And what is that? Anybody at all? It would make my day. He didn't show him the church. He didn't show us the church that we are in today. The church, which is the body of Christ, and Paul called it a mystery. It was a mystery to the prophets. They didn't see it. They couldn't see it. It was not for them to see Here's the prophets. I'm, I, I'm worried about my time now. Here's the mountain. Here's another mountain. And then here's another mountain like that. And what they could see looked like that. Well, they could see the suffering servant. Isaiah had a suffering servant and a coming king. They saw the suffering servant and they saw a coming king. There it is. They could see that. They, didn't, they couldn't see how much time is in here. They didn't know when the time frame was or here either. Either They could look down and serve their ministry to the people that they were living among. But then they could see this. So the first advent of Christ and the second advent of Christ, they saw. They could see that. Scripture, I can show you all through that. But what they didn't see, Paul calls it mystery, the mysterion. The mystery is the body of Christ. The church which is the body of Christ. The Musterion. They didn't see that. So in Daniel, you're going to see this. He's going to see world, worldly empires, like here's the Romans who killed, who crucified Jesus right here. And then over here, you're going to have the world empire, the revised 
Some of the scholars used to call it the revised Roman Empire. This, the, the world's empire will be revised again before uh, the Lord comes. There's been great one world governments before, like Babylon was the great world empire. Then there was other, the, P the Medes and the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans, and then the Romans, you know, fall apart. And here you have a revival of one world empire, okay? And that's what you get in the tribulation. And so when that's complete, the Lord comes to deliver his people at the end of the tribulation, and then they go into the millennium. Well, we'll do this later. You know, we don't have to get into it right now. But yeah, that's the picture. That's what we're looking when we say the view of the world history. Right down to when Jesus Christ was crucified. But that we don't know when he's coming again, though, right? Remember they said to the Lord when he died and he was resurrected and he spent 40 days on the earth with his disciples. Remember that? And then when he ascended, right before he ascended, his disciples said, Lord, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? Will you, will you restore the kingdom? And Jesus says, not for you to know. It's, it's going to be, it's preserved over here. And here's the second coming right here, right there. But we don't know when that's going to be, do we? We sure don't. We don't know when the rapture will take place. And the rapture will take place, the body of Christ goes out at the rapture, Tribulation follows on the earth, but we don't know. We, once the tribulation starts, you can count to the rapture, to the second advent. Once this starts, you can count to when the Lord's coming by. Maybe not the day, but the time, the time frame. But over here, in here, we can't, we can't count anything. There's not, you can't count any time. And somebody said, well, I figured out when the Lord's coming. Run from that guy. Run from it. He's dangerous. It can't be done. It cannot be done. Because this is an undetermined time. Okay? Uh, this is a determined time. How do we know that? From Daniel. We know how long this lasts from Daniel. And then, of course, the other uh, apocalyptic revelation in the New Testament was the book of Revelation. And so we'll get to that maybe in a moment. Now, the languages. Let's talk about that. The language is uh, Aramaic. And that's the same as the Chaldee or the... Uh, this, uh, and then, and then the Hebrew, the Ara Aramaic or Chaldee. I call it Chaldee, and Hebrew. I have a Chaldee lexicon I had when I was in seminary. It was Hebrew and Chaldee, and the Chaldee was what was spoken by the Babylonians, and the Hebrew was what was spoken by the by the Jews. The, they spoke the Hebrew. All right, and then the purpose. Oh, that's, that's a big one. What's the purpose? All right. This is a few people making comments about it. This is Thomas uh, Constable. Here's what he said the purpose was. He says, at, a, at such a time as this, and that would be the fall, they're all enslaved, they're in another land, a strange land, maybe even hostile situation on the part of some of them. And at such a time as this, God revealed his supernatural power. He did... He did this to demonstrate that he is the one true God and that he is still sovereign over the affairs of humanity and sovereign over history. He manifest, how did he do this? He manifested his power to the supreme rulers of Babylon and Persia so that they might know that he governs over everyone from heaven and that he alone is God. And that's uh, one comment about the purpose. Another comment. Uh, about the purpose is Charles Dyer. He saw his, this is what he said. He said, Daniel wrote first, number one, to show God's future program for the nation of Israel. What does God have planned for the nation of Israel? In light of her fall. Or she's fallen now, she's destroyed. The temple is completely destroyed and burned. So in light of that, God wants to show Israel that uh, during that his purpose for Israel, even though they fallen. And he goes on and says, during and after the times of the Gentiles. And then secondly, number two, uh, he wrote to show what the believer's present response should be as they await the coming kingdom of God. And Daniel encouraged his readers to remain faithful to God in a hostile uh, society while they waited for God's promised kingdom. The promised kingdom is way over here and they were way back here in 6th century B.C. 
But you see, it unfolds. It took a while for the Lord to come. And it's just, it, the Lord's coming again. He came the first time by promise. He's coming the second time by promise. Ye men of Galilee, why are you standing here gazing? This same Jesus that's taken up from you today will likewise come again. That's the second advent of Christ. Back to the earth. Okay. There it is. So, so what's the theology behind all this? And mainly the theology of, of Daniel will be the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God is the main one. But I have four things here. The sovereignty of God, mainly in the miracles that he performs in Babylon, in chapters 1 through 6, through Daniel, miracles happen. And then chapters 7 through 12 show the sovereignty of God over Gentile nations and over Israel by unveiling what he will do with them in the far future. And then Daniel's message was one of judgment, especially the period that Jesus referred to as the times of the Gentiles. In Luke 21, verse 24, Jesus said the times of the Gentiles. Now that's If you don't know what the times of the Gentiles is, you need to learn because that's a factor in what happens in world history. You know what we're living in right now? The times of the Gentiles. Now I give you a definition right there below it. Here's the definition of the times of the Gentiles. This comes from uh, Dwight, uh, J. Dwight Pentecost, who was a, a professor at Dallas Seminary. In his book, I cite the book and the page number. Here it is. The times of the Gentiles is that extended period of time in which the land uh, given in covenant by God to Abraham and his descendants is occupied by Gentile world powers. And... The divinic throne is empty of any rightful heir to the divinic throne, throne of David. The times of the Gentiles, when does it begin? The times of the Gentiles began with Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of Jerusalem in 605 B.C. and will continue till the Messiah returns. That's the second advent of Jesus Christ. When Jesus will subdue the nations when he comes, and he will deliver the land of Israel from its Gentile occupants and will bring the nation of Israel into her coveted blessings in the millennial kingdom. Boy, that took a lot. He's talking about from all the Babylon here all the way back through. You say, well, you know, the Gentiles aren't controlling Israel today. Oh, they are. Oh, they are. You know, they are. And uh, so we have to realize, you know, that you've always had Gentile rule. Uh, as far as the throne of David, nobody in Israel today claims the throne of David, a descendant, so that's empty. And the, the, the land is being, you know, constantly fought over and controlled by all kinds of factors. And then there's no one to replace the throne of David. So that's the time of the Gentiles. And so when the time of the Gentiles is complete, guess what happened? That's when the Lord comes. And this is when the time of the Gentiles is, is complete right here. That's when the Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles is complete. And one, there's two different ways of interpreting that. One is, yeah, it's complete in the sense that it's folded out in, in chronology. The other is when the corruption of the world is so bad, it's reached that completion under the, time, under the Gentile powers. And then the Lord comes right here. But it certainly is corrupt here, maybe like it's never been before. Jesus in Matthew 24 said that the time of uh, this time of tribulation, the, the time of wrath, the time of the great tribulation, he calls it, he says it's a time that's going to be the hardest time that's ever been known on the face of the earth. Nothing had ever been worse before, and nothing will be worse after. It's going to be the worst time that's ever happened on the earth. And so that's going to be right in here. And so the times of the Gentiles, Gentile world power, ruling the world, doing what Gentiles want to do, and it will reach full, com full corruption at this point. That's my understanding of it. Okay. All right. Or it reaches a certain number that God has for the time for the Lord to come by. All right. So there it is. 
uh, times of the Gentiles. You can pull that up, study it. You can pull out all kinds of information on that. And then, the, all right, so sovereignty of God is one of the theological themes in the book of Daniel. We would have thought that, right? The sovereignty of God. Then the next one would be the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan that, that began with the fall of Adam and will continue until the return and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. What does Jesus do when he comes back? This is the Garden of Eden on the earth. He, he restores things, right? This is before you get new heavens and new earth. This is the millennial reign on the earth, this, this earth. And so uh, that shows the redemption that Jesus brought, brings to restore what Adam lost. He regains what Adam lost and brings the, the uh, humanity into redemption. Number three is the grace of God. We do see the grace of God in the book of Daniel. I'll try to point it out as we go through it. And then the last one there is <clears throat> the power of prayer, uh, which is seen in chapters 1 through 6 and chapter 9 and chapter 10 of Daniel. We see God answering prayer. We see God sending an angel to Daniel. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, the angel greets Daniel by saying, Thou most most beloved of God. That's, that's a pretty good comment, isn't it? You know, if you, what would an angel say about you or me? Yeah. Daniel was the most beloved of God. And he, he addressed him that way, and then he gave him information that he was supposed to give him. All right, now the genre, the word genre is just the type of literature it is. The genre, let's look at that quickly. Daniel is a book of three things. It's a narrative history. It's a narrative history. In other words, it's going to tell a story. There's stories in Daniel. You know, you did those Sunday school with children. There's stories in Daniel. Daniel's lion's den and all this stuff. So there's, uh, there's historical uh, history, narrative history, historical narrative, and then there's predictive prophecy. Predictive prophecy. And then it's apocalyptic. Those are three kinds of literature. And so you have the uh, predictive uh, prophecy, uh, referred to. Uh, let me see what we could do with that. Uh, oh, that's where I quoted what I put on the board. Uh, that's from Woodward. Wolf, uh, Woodward. Woodward was uh, the president of Dallas Seminary at one time. He's dead now, I think. Some of you might have his study Bible. But here's what he said. In many respects, he's talking about the predictive, predictive prophecy of Daniel. He says, in many respects, the book of Daniel is the most comprehensive prophetic revelation of the Old Testament, giving the only total view of world history from Babylon to the second advent of Christ and interrelating Gentile history and prophecy with that which concerns Israel. Daniel provides the key, this is important, he provides the key to the overall interpretation of prophecy and he is a major element in premillennialism, and he is essential to the interpretation of the book of Revelation. No one can, listen, no one can interpret the book of Revelation without the book of Daniel. You just, you know, flying by the seat of your pants. Because you've got to learn Daniel before you're going to be able to interpret Revelation for sure. That's what he says here. It's the key. It's essential to the interpretation of the book of Revelation. He says, in revelation of the, it's, uh, its revelation of the sovereignty and the power of God has brought assurance to Jew and Gentile alike that God will fulfill his sovereign purposes in time and in eternity. Uh, you know, that, why do I get excited about prophecy? Because I'm part of this over here, the body of Christ. I know what's going to happen here because God's already told us. And then, so, and I know what's going to happen here, so God's already told me. What does that help me be? I, it helps me be pretty calm about things. It gives me a great deal of peace about things. I'm not falling apart over what's going to happen. And I guarantee you things are going to happen fast in this country and in the world. And so what should we be? What manner of persons ought we to be knowing that these things shall be dissolved, Peter says, right? In 2 Peter 3. What kind of people? We ought to be godly. We ought to do what Daniel did. What did Daniel do? He made a commitment from his own heart to be faithful to God. What kind of shape was he in? He was a prisoner as a teenager. He was taken from his own home. 
and, and, and made the trip all the way to Babylon by foot and then put in a, and he was, he was made a eunuch. That ought to, you know, perk up a teenager. You know what a eunuch is. I'm not going to go into that. Look it up if you don't know. Because he was made a eunuch. Let me uh, read that to you where I found that out. In the prophecy of Isaiah, in Isaiah 39, let's put it up here because it's not in your notes. Isaiah 39, verse 7. <clears throat> Isaiah speaks of the young men. Here it is. He speaks of the young men of Judah being taken away and made eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Who are these young men? We know them as Daniel and you know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We don't know their the Hebrew. We know their we know their Babylonian names: Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were made eunuchs. Uh, who, who were they put under? They were put under the chief eunuch. If you have the chief eunuch, what are they there for? They're to take care of the eunuchs, right? And here, listen to this. They were made, made, Isaiah said they were made eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. This prophecy took place during the younger years of Daniel's life. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 and following state that Daniel was among those who were brought to Babylon, in verse 6 in particular. Also, we see that Daniel was placed under the charge of Aspenaz. Aspenaz, the chief of the eunuchs, master of the eunuchs. The fact that Daniel rose to such a high position of authority under the rules of Nebuchadnezzar and Darius the Mede almost certainly confirms that Daniel was made a eunuch. It was a common practice in biblical days to prevent any offspring being born in that palace that might challenge the throne. We don't want any kids, boy kids being born here among my staff they might challenge my throne one day. We don't do that. We make eunuchs. Eunuchs don't have children. Okay, now, that much we know. All right, now, that's the genre. One more thing about the genre, that number three down there, is uh, we, had, uh, we had narrative history, which is those stories. We had predictive his uh, prophecy, which we just talked about. And then we have apocalyptic literature. In the Old Testament, there are, in the Old Testament, there's three apocalyptic books. I taught one here about a year ago, Zechariah. Remember, it had a lot of strange stuff in it, Zechariah. And then Ezekiel, which we just got through studying in our Sunday uh, Bible study. And then Daniel. So Daniel, Ezekiel, and Zechariah are the three apocalyptic books in the Old Testament. Apocalyptic books. All right, so uh, Revelation in the New Testament is the only apocalyptic book. So in the New Testament, the apocalypse is the book of Revelation. Apocalypse is the apocalyptic book. So you, so you say, okay, what is apocalyptic literature? Well, I gave you the definition right there. So let me give you the definition, and I quoted somebody, another professor at Dallas, and then another person down there, and I, I quote, you know, the... the where I got it. Apocalyptic literature is a symbol, visionary prophetic literature, symbolic visionary prophetic literature composed during oppressive times. That, that's important because it's times when people, God's people were crushed is when you have those apocalyptic uh, uh, visions. Consisting of visions whose events are recorded exactly as they were seen by the author and explain through a divine interpreter. Usually an angel. You read the book of Revelation, an angel interprets. And then it goes on, and whose theological content is primarily eschatological. Eschatological, eschatological means what? The future being predicted. Okay? And then one other statement there. Passages, this is of great importance here. Passages such as Matthew 24 and 25, Matthew, Mark 13 and Luke 21, and the book of Revelation are unintelligible without a knowledge of the book of Daniel. And that's very, very true. In Matthew 24, which I've already spoken about, Jesus quotes Daniel. 
he has to he has to quote Daniel something Daniel said in order to for him to be able to say what he was wanting to say, and so you have to go back to what did Daniel mean by desolation? You know that that person is going to stand there in the temple and is going to bring destruction. All right, now the scripture, go down there. I mean the structure. The structure is easy. I mean you got study Bibles that have huge structures. Uh, I've seen so many of them. I could have given you uh, for many, many structures. The simplest structure is chapters 1 through 6. There it is. Chapter 1 through 6 is the history of Daniel. And then chapter 7 through 12 is the prophecies of Daniel. That's easy. His, about his life and the stories, things that happened to him. And then what he prophesied would happen. The predictive prophecies of Daniel. That's the structure. And then the message real quick. Uh, uh, the message real quick. We have two things there. First of all, we've already learned that one of the themes is the sovereignty of God. And this falls into two areas. In, in history, God is sovereign in history. Well, I used to put it like this. God is sovereign in creation. God is sovereign in providence. And God is so sovereign in salvation. In creation, in providence, and in salvation. Uh, so you have this, Yahweh is sovereign in history. God is sovereign over history. And we evidence this by the three rulers that he dealt with in chapters 1 through 6. They learned that he was sovereign. They were the heathen rulers. They learned that he was sovereign. You know, the God of heaven. They learned that he was the main God when they had all kinds of pantheons. All right, and then God is, abs God is absolutely sovereign in the future. Uh, that's the subject of prophecy. So we'll go down to the next point there. Concerning prophecy. The major subjects of prophecy in this book are three. Three things real quick. First of all, prophecy about Gentile nations. Secondly, the prophets, uh, prophecy about the Israelites in their near future. Their near future. And the near future would have been <coughs> Daniel actually prophesied what was going to happen in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes. There it is. But he also prophesied Alexander the Great. Listen to this. This is this will blow you away. Jos 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 Joseph Jophis Josephus. Uh, I'm trying to say a word. Jophis. I'd like to preach or something. Yeah, thank you very much. He wrote he was a Roman and a Jew. He was a Jew and a Roman. And he wrote the a history of Rome. He wrote a history for his people. He was a Jew and a Roman, Roman citizen, Josephus. And he wrote about the time that Alexander the Great, in running through the world and conquering everybody, came to Jerusalem. And instead of destroying the city and burning it and conquering it, the, pre the rabbi, the priest, went out with the book of Daniel met him outside with the book of Daniel. Daniel, that's that scroll. And opened it up and showed him that Daniel had prophesied that Alexander the Great would come and would be a conqueror. He went in and worshipped at the temple and spared the city. Josephus said that. <clears throat> you can check it out. It's a matter of record. Can you trust Joseph, Josephus? Well, most of the time you can trust him. Uh, okay, now, so that's that. Also, the last thing there, so, so, so as Daniel looked down, he could see things that happened before the time of Jesus. That would be like the Antiochus Epiphany, right down here, or Alexander the Great, and then the Romans came in. He saw all that. But also that last part, he saw far beyond that. Far beyond that. And so the <coughs> third general subject of prophecy is the far far history, the far future. This involved Israel's affairs culminating in a greater persecution under a Roman-like ruler, a Roman-like ruler, a revised Roman-like ruler who we know him as the Antichrist. The Antichrist in chapter 9 and verse 27 of Daniel, chapter 11, verses 36 through 45 of Daniel. This would happen in the far future, the time of the end. All right, now, let's move into the lesson you're going to be teaching on Sunday morning. Okay, that's the introduction. And the introduction, for me, 
we, we have to give things that people can hang their thoughts on. And so now we'll, let's read this. It, your lesson on Sunday starts with verse 8 and goes through 21. So I might better just do that because of time, and I do want to get through on time. So I'll just do 8. I want to do all 21 verses. But look at verse 8. He says, Daniel made up his mind. We've been talking about Daniel, you know, being a youth. And he was brought to he was brought to Babylon as a, an exile. Uh, it is interesting that the king ordered in verse three. The king had ordered Aspenaz, the chief of the eunuchs, to bring some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family, and some of the nobles. And so Daniel was a member of some of the royal family. And it, verse four it says they were to be youths in whom had no defect, no defect, who were good-looking, handsome, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding. Look at that word, endowed. Endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. And that was for three year, a three-year program. So that's what we find. So, uh, he, so when we pick up our lesson, uh, he's already, they gave him new names. They gave him Bab Babylonian names to take away their identity from Jew the Jews or from Israel. They wanted them to be uh, identified with the gods of Babylon. Every name they gave them was of some god of Babylon. Okay, so they, they tagged them with, you know, you are of Baal, or you are of whatever, you know, Molech, or whatever it was. So, and by verse 8, we get Daniel's impression now. It says, but Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice of food or with the wine, because they were given all the king's diet. The king said, you know, feed them well. They're, they're going to be serving in my court. And, uh, or the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Uh, so so he, don't want to, he, he doesn't want to eat of the king's meat. The meat was probably offered to idols, okay? They, that was standard. And if it had been offered to idols, it was forbidden for him to eat it under Mosaic law. Under Mosaic law, couldn't eat meat offered to idols. That's different than what Paul talks about, but we're not under the Mosaic law now. But these Jews were. And so, uh, so it was always dedicated to some god. So he decided he didn't want to eat that. So he says, he asked permission. And so... That's going to be a point that we wanted, we wanted to make, that one of the things about Daniel was he had true humility. And, you know, when you have to ask permission of great people or elders even, you know, to humble yourself to ask permission, he asked in the right way. And what did God do in verse 9? It says, And God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of, of, of the eunuchs. Some of the translation says the love or compassion. God granted Daniel that. That's God's grace working in another person. Uh, granting Daniel uh, grace, favor, favor. Like Joseph, remember, when he was in prison, there was favor given to him. And so you, sometimes that reminds you, don't go off on your lesson on Joseph, though, because you got too much to do here. <laughs> but look at verse 10. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, Well, I'm afraid... Uh, my lord the king who's appointed your food and your drink for why should I see your faces looking more haggard another translation sad than the youths that are your own age then you would make me forfeit my head to the king so the master of the eunuchs is a, who does he fear he fears the king Daniel feared the lord so Daniel goes in verse 11 and says, But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the, of the eunuchs had appointed over him, over Daniel, and Hananiah, uh, Hananiah and Mishael, and Azariah, 
Verse 12, that's their Hebrew name. Verse 12, this is the test he proposed. Test, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables uh, to eat and water to drink. That's what he asked for. Now this is not advertisement for all vegetable food, okay? It's the fact that he didn't eat this because it was not lawful for him to eat meat offered to idols in Babylon. And most of it's probably what kind of meat? Pork. It was probably pork. And a Jew couldn't eat pork. And so give us vegetables and water. Verse 13. Now vegetables and water is good. You know, collard greens, things like that, really good. Uh, some herbs like onion, you know, dinner onions, whatever. Verse 13. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice of food. And deal with us your service according to to what you see and so he listened to them now this is the grace of god here right he listened to them in this matter and he tested them for 10 days and at the end of the 10 days their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating at the king's choice now you know it doesn't mean they were obese this is not what it means it just means they were perky and they looked better and than they did after that long walk from Jerusalem to Babylon, because they were just probably uh, pretty pretty down and out looking people, you know, fugitives. And so they picked up, they perked up, they looked good. And so it says, so the overseer continued to withhold their choice of food and the wine, uh, and the wine that they were to drink, and they kept giving them vegetables, each of vegetables, verse 17. As for those four youths, God gave them. Now notice this. This is what I wanted to show you. The, secret, the scripture says, The secrets of the Most High, the secrets of the Lord, are with those who fear Him. You're not going to get one insight from the Word of God unless you reverence yourself before Him. And we know that Daniel has done this and his three friends have done this. They've determined to be faithful to God in that land, strange land that they were taken from their families and made units. And so what did God do? This is God's grace. As for those four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. This is in their three years of, you know, study. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days, which the king had specified for presenting them at the end of the three years, the commander of the, of the eunuchs presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. And your translation says, and the king interviewed them. And this is, in the military, was, we have passing in review, or we have inspection, uh, you know. And so the king inspects these people, right? And he goes through them and he interviews them. And he interviews them, it says he interviewed them, and out of and out of them, all but one was found. No one, excuse me. Out of them, no one was found like Daniel uh, and uh, the other three, and uh, Ananiah and Mishael and the Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. All right. So they were brought on in. There was graduation day, maybe a ribbon, you know, basic training ribbon, whatever it was. Verse twenty. As for every matter of wisdom, this is what he, the king interviewed him about. We know what he talked to him about. For every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, interviewed them, tested them, he found them ten times better than all the magi uh, magicians and the conjurers, or uh, that's the word mediums, astrologer, in all the realm. And then David and Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. That little statement then says he continued on in the court for 70 years. That's the end of it. So that's exciting. That's exciting where, you know, God took a young boy and brought him to a, not, not just a, you know, he didn't select his own career. He brought him to a place of, of great authority. Great authority. Under the, under the king of Babylon, okay? And here's a few things about this.
little application. God blessed Daniel's commitment uh, and added to him abilities and perception and wisdom, as we just saw. And so how should we as how should we relate to unbelievers in strange situations? Well, do like Daniel, be humble. Daniel was uh, humbly asked permission, right, of the older man. Show respect. And one more thing, we'll close. Daniel was effective in what he did because he put his personal ambition under the will of God. He put his personal ambition under the will of God. Young people, young people today should put should seek the will of the Lord over their career. Seek the will of the Lord over your ambition. Because your ambition can be way off. And you live the rest of your life doing something you hate doing and you fail at it or you just get corrupted in it. What does God want you to do? That's not just for preachers. It's for any of us, all of us, even now as we get older. What does God want us to do? And it, dedicate in your heart. You're going to be faithful to Him. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank You for the opportunity to share it tonight, this, this Word. And we pray that you'll help it be settled in our mind and our hearts. We seek to understand. The eyes of our understanding, Father, we pray ask that our understanding would be enlightened. And uh, you make this a source of blessing to all of us. And help us as we communicate this later to our classes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Welcome.